Uh, I won't guarantee that you'll go away tonight feeling less depressed than you were when you came in, but you may have a better idea of why you're feeling so miserable. Uh, Winston Churchill famously suffered uh, serious bouts of depression, and it was he that described it as the black dog, uh, which is depicted here. Uh, he wasn't alone, of course. Um, up to 10% of the population is said to suffer clinical levels of depression at some time or another in their lives. Uh, and uh, it is certainly the number one psychiatric uh, condition. And according to the World Health Organization, it is actually the, uh, the leading health issue uh, of all uh, across the entire world. So quite clearly an important uh, problem. Let's try that one. Uh, the symptoms of depression are pretty well known. Um, deficiency in mood uh, is the most obvious one, but there are a lot of other, others in a constellation around it. Lack of energy, inability to enjoy life, um, being pessimistic, lacking self-confidence, um, lacking concentration, and occasional guilt feelings, usually quite inappropriate. Uh, it's unipolar depression is distinguished from bipolar, which is ups and downs of mood. Uh, the manic phases, as they used to be called, include euphoria, impulsivity, and flight of ideas, getting uh, uh, often very ambitious ideas that can lead to, to great industry and occasionally creative contributions. The depressive symptoms are much the same as with unipolar depression. Now, as with um, diabetes, there's a type 1 and a type 2, and the only difference is the, um, the relative strength of the, the manic phase, that uh, in type 2 you tend to be strongly depressed, but uh, just sort of uh, nipping over the top of the curve uh, in, in your hypomanic mood, as it's called. There are a couple of other variants that are quite well known, uh, postnatal depression in, in mothers, uh, one of whom ran her car into the White House gates the other day and uh, got shot for the trouble, rather tragically. Uh, seasonal affective disorder, there'll be a lot of it about fairly soon as the nights get lo longer, because it is the sort of depression that occurs every winter, particularly in northern climates or southern, but there isn't much land down that way. Now, where does uh, depression come from? Well, there's considerable genetic input. Uh, the twin studies suggest that uh, close to half of the variation comes from genetics. Now, uh, that could mean either that each case is about half genetic and half environmental, or it might mean that some are entirely genetic and others not at all. Uh, it's probably a little bit of both of those things. But clearly, um, having a first-degree relative who is depressed raises your risk enormously, about two or three times. Uh, if that relative uh, has recurrent uh, depression of very early origin, your risk is elevated to about four or five times. There is genetic overlap with bipolar disorder and with anxiety, other uh, forms of neuroses, uh, but there's also some degree of genetic uh, separation amongst those syndromes. Occasionally you find uh, identical twins where one is depressed and the other is not, and uh, that's very interesting to the scientists because, of course, they then go to see if they can see something that happened to the uh, depressed twin that did not happen to the other, and that sort of research has shown that uh, various forms of uh, stress, particularly broken personal relationships and broken uh, romantic relationships, seem to be characteristic of the twin that uh, becomes depressed. But of course, it is not at all clear uh, as to the direction of cause and effect. And there is some evidence to show that at least a third of the environmental influences due to not just to bad luck, but to bad management, people making uh, decisions that get them into trouble. 
because, of course, people do uh, find their own environments. They adjust the environment, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Uh, the other thing about those identical twin studies, of course, is that we now know that uh, there are such things as epigenetics, which are environmental effects usually occurring uh, very early on, uh, possibly even before birth, possibly even in ancestors, which can alter the, uh, the expression of certain genes in ways that have very striking effects. For example, you can have one twin who is left-handed, the other an identical twin, but he's right-handed. Uh, you can have one twin is straight and the other is gay. Striking effects, almost mirror image effects uh, that are down to epigenetics, and that's a, a thriving field for the future. When you're looking at gene-environment interactions in the determination of depression, some people have said that uh, the comparison of orchids and dandelions is illuminating. Uh, dandelions will thrive almost anywhere, uh, any environment at all. Orchids do extremely well in ideal conditions, but they will wilt uh, <coughs> under bad conditions. And the idea is that depression-prone people are genetically predisposed as being sensitive to emotional knockbacks of one sort or another during development. Child abuse, child neglect, unstable relationships, lack of social support uh, are the sorts of things that are likely to be implicated. That's where the researchers tend to look. Um, this is a study by Caspi, who was one of my colleagues at the Institute of Psychiatry, um, showing the effect of a particular um, gene no one gene is responsible for the genetic effects on depression. It's almost certainly a, a multi-gene field. But uh, there are certain gene locations that have attracted a lot of research interest. This is one of them, the serotonin transporter gene. It's got a lot of letters, but better known perhaps as CERT, serotonin transporter. Uh, now, you inherit um, one form from each parent so that you can have uh, two of the short form, uh, or two of the long, or one short, one long. And it turns out that the more short ones you've got, the more short alleles of the serotonin transporter gene, the more susceptible you are to life's stresses. And this is Caspi's results. That's the, um, the measure of uh, proneness to depression and this is the number of stressful uh, life events that that person has been exposed to. And you can see that the people with the two short alleles uh, pack up under stress much more rapidly. But it is, um, it is only under life stress that they are more prone to depression. So it is a gene-environment interaction. Now, what is stressful in the environment? Any change in our lives seems to be stressful, and it doesn't matter too much whether that change uh, is uh, a negative one, like getting divorced or losing your spouse, uh, or actually what many people would think of as a positive one, like getting married um, or a marital reconciliation. But any change in your life pattern requires adjustment and is stressful. That's been known for some time. And as I mentioned earlier, that uh, it is possible in the research to sort the environmental uh, ex or stressful experiences into those that uh, might be causal, in the sense that it's a, a misfortune that you could not do anything about, and others where the, the individual's own behavior may have contributed in some way. And it seems that about one-third is down to um, mismanagement, depression-prone individuals making bad choices in life. So it's a very complex thing, the interaction between the genes and the environment. Now, the effect of the serotonin transporter gene has been linked to certain uh, brain areas, and in particular, emotional circuits connecting 
the cingulate cortex here and the amygdala here. The amygdala is the sort of the powerhouse of emotions. It's a, it's a threat center, if you like. And this is the area of the cortex which is there to modulate it uh, or handle it in some way, regulate it. And what the research of these people suggests is that uh, people with short certs, emotion-prone people, uh, tend to have smaller areas of grey matter in, uh, in this area, the cingulate cortex, which makes it more difficult uh, for them to regulate uh, output from the amygdala. They have poorer regulation of their emotions, and it is this, apparently, which makes them more stress-prone. Now, the um, depression is obviously connected with uh, the activity in certain neurotransmitters. They're called monoamines uh, they, as, a, as a group, because there is one amine group. I don't know enough about the organic chemistry to tell you what, what that means, but uh, uh, it involves one nitrogen and uh, various other things attached to it, but it comes as an organic group uh, which links these monoamines. Uh, and three of them are particularly interesting in connection with depression. Serotonin, which seems to modulate our mood. It's a contentment hormone, you might say, that high levels of serotonin go with being rather relaxed about life. Uh, norepinephrine uh, seems to control alertness. It's, a, it's like the, the brain's equivalent of adrenaline. In fact, chemically, I think it is pretty much like adrenaline. And the third one is dopamine, which uh, is associated with the pleasure and reward system and obviously is involved in addiction. Now, these are organized as circuits which run, start around the brain stem uh, and the midbrain and then radiate to all parts of the cortex. That's the serotonin system and this is norepinephrine, something a little bit similar uh, can be seen with dopamine. Now, the interesting thing is that most of the standard antidepressants amplify monoamines, uh, possibly all three of them, possibly only one or two of them. And uh, the effects of psychological therapies, things like cognitive behavior therapy, may produce the same chemistry uh, from, a starting, from a different starting point. Probably the most fashionable antidepressant group at the moment uh, is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as Prozac. That was the famous one. And they work by blocking the reuptake of the serotonin that has been produced in the end of one nerve cell, crosses the synapse to the, to the target uh, neuron on the other side. That's sending out the serotonin signal to fire this. But then the serotonin gets taken back up and stored in vesicles ready to be used again. Now, what the, uh, the reuptake inhibitors do is uh, kind of block that channel. So there's a lot more serotonin hanging around the synapse. And this tends to prolong its positive effect on mood. Uh, the effect may not be immediate. It might take uh, several weeks for it to work if indeed it is going to work at all. So that's the question. Do these uh, antidepressants work? They're uh, much debated. Uh, they have side effects. Uh, they may be addictive. Uh, but uh, most interesting of all, they do not seem to be effective with mild depression. Placebos are just as good. In this diagram, uh, this is the average placebo effect with all those sort of greeny circles, uh, data points. And uh, the red line is the average to the smooth curve for antidepressant drug effects, the, tri the red triangles. And it is only uh, when you start with a very high level of uh, 
severity in depression as measured by something called the Hamilton Rating Scale of Depression. Uh, only uh, at high levels on the Hamilton scale can you see a difference between the active drug and the placebo. But it does seem that the difference is due to the placebo ceasing to work. In other words, the only reason that uh, antidepressant drugs work better than placebos is the placebos cease to operate at high levels of depression. Here's a plant that you might recognize from your garden, Bright brightens the garden a little bit, uh, and uh, it's called St. John's Wort, or Hypericum, the official Latin name. And uh, it, it seems to work as well as the antidepressant drugs, possibly by a mechanism very similar to an SSRI. And it may even have fewer side effects. Um, there are negative results that come out from time to time, uh, less often in German-speaking countries. Uh, interestingly, nobody's quite sure why, but there is a much longer tradition of using St. John's wort as a treatment for depression than in uh, Britain or America. The, the drug companies aren't much interested in St. John's wort because they can't slap a patent on it. It's a, it's a natural product. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, they don't, obviously, they're not prepared to promote uh, the uh, efficacy of St. John's Wort. Um, it's worth noting that the commercially available ones that you would buy in the health stores and so on vary enormously in the concentration of Hypericum, and uh, some of them almost certainly are not effective. When they are effective, you have to consider that just because they are natural, it doesn't make them safe. If it's a, an active uh, <laughs> compound, then it's likely to have side effects, some of which will be harmful. Uh, and in the case of St. John's wort, it uh, will interact with other drugs, particularly antidepressants, if you ha had them from the doctor and then taking your own uh, St. John's wort on top. You might be doubling the dose. Uh, they're also known to cause photosensitivity, that is, make you more sensitive to the sun, you might get sunburned on a cloudy day if you're taking St. John's Ward. Now, an American psychologist called Martin Seligman, back in the late 1960s, where, uh, interestingly, he was working at, at the Maudsley Hospital in, in my first few day, a few years there. Uh, he noticed that... Um, Dogs that were subjected to inescapable shock, they're sadists, these animal behaviorists, you know, uh, failed to take effective action when the conditions were changed such that escape now became possible. And he said that they had learned to be helpless. And this became a model for depression, uh, both as a human clinical phenomenon and as an animal model in, in studying the biochemical effects of depression. So Seligman reckoned that depression was caused by a feeling of powerlessness, being unable to control events, and that you could acquire this from unhappy life experiences. Later on, of course, the people studying learned helplessness discovered that there were personality effects that were important and that it really depended on how you attributed the causes of things around you. Pessimists tending to blame themselves uh, rather than bad luck for any negative outcomes. And that hence they are much more prone to depression. Cognitive behaviour therapy... Uh, is the main alternative contender to antidepressant drugs. And it's based on the premise that depression is um, secondary to negative thoughts, that you think yourself into a low mood. Low mood is seen as the, the consequence of, of having self-destructive or maladaptive thought patterns. For example, a person has lost their job and they would say, well, economic conditions are difficult, they had to let somebody go and they would set out looking for another job, whereas um, the, the person 
uh, with a negative thought pattern would uh, conclude from that, I've lost my job, I'm totally useless, nobody will ever give me another job again. And the cognitive behavior therapist will say, that is the thought pattern that needs to be changed. So they challenge that mode of thinking and uh, hope that by cutting in at that, port, at that point, the depressive thoughts, they can alter the emotions, hence actions, and the vicious cycle can be broken. Now, it has to be said that most of the research that has been done on this uh, suggests that mood and maladaptive thinking tend to uh, go in parallel. That is, one does not take causal priority over the other, but it doesn't matter too much because you can intercede at any point in the cycle and hopefully do some good. Most patients who come into a surgery with a major depression are prescribed drugs initially, but only about 40% of them get better after a two or three month period. And then they try another approach, uh, of, might be CBT. But it would be very useful to know in advance which patient is going to benefit from which kind of treatment. And uh, there is this research using PET scans, positive e emission tomography, um, to show that uh, if a person shows high spontaneous activity in this area, their anterior insula, uh, this is the front of the, the brain, so it's the anterior part of the insula, will do better with drugs than with CBT. If they have low activity in that area of the brain, they tend to do better with cognitive behavior therapy than they do with, with drugs. So that theoretically would be a way of deciding uh, who should get what treatment, but of course it's extremely expensive and, and intrusive, and the search is on uh, for more practical ways uh, of deciding, uh, of personalizing treatment, one of which might be gene markers, because uh, it has been shown, for example, that people with the short cert, serotonin transporter, uh, will benefit more from cognitive behavior therapy than from drugs. You can monitor recovery processes in the brain and, uh, again, using PET scans, comparing what's happening in the brain with drugs and with cognitive behavior therapy. And uh, the interesting thing is that... Uh, you arrive at the same point, but from different directions. It, it appears the, the people who have done this research interpret their results, and it, it looks a bit of a, a mess. Take you a while to sort your way through through that. That's CBT. That is a, an SSRI. Uh, but they describe the difference as being a bottom-up chain of events that is starting in the midbrain with the drugs and moving up to the cortex, midbrain and cortex. Uh, as against top-down for cognitive behavior therapy, which is that the effect seems to start in the control centers uh, of the frontal part of the brain and uh, moves down to, to the midbrain. Uh, so you can get to the same place, but from different starting points. <laughs> uh, now... There was a time when it was thought by neuroscientists that we were born with all the nerve cells uh, in our head that we would ever have. And it was just a matter of these dropping out and uh, uh, decaying. But um, recent research using carbon-14 dating of nerve cells shows that, in fact, new cells are being generated in the hippocampus. Uh, radioactive um, carbon-14 is interesting because uh, there was plenty of it about in the atmosphere when they were all, the Americans and Russians and so on, were testing their bombs. But after the nuclear test ban in the 1960s, the carbon-14 levels uh, in the atmosphere declined, and that has enabled us to tell at what per point in a person's life particular cells in the hippocampus were generated. And uh, they were 
here it is here, the stem cells turning into uh, full mature neurons in, within the hippocampus. And uh, it was possible, it, it, with post-mortem data, obviously, <laughs> to, to date uh, the origin of cells, and it was discovered that we had something like called neurogenesis, which is new neurons being generated within the lifetime of the individual. Uh, but depressed patients showed less new nerve growth in this area. And the other interesting finding was that antidepressant drugs tend to promote the growth of new cells originating in the hippocampus. They assist in brain repair. Well, there are, apart from drugs and CBT, what else might work for depression? One is light therapy, very bright light, does seem to have the capacity to alleviate depression, particularly people who have the seasonal affective kind of depression, uh, and you simulate an earlier dawn by a burst of bright light uh, before the sun comes up in the winter. It seems that the blue wavelengths are particularly important within this light because they are the ones that are most deficient in nearly all forms of artificial lighting. Uh, and the effects of light therapy are generally of the same order as Prozac, but they can't be added to the effects of Prozac if you are doing both at once. And uh, the mechanism is believed to involve a hormone called melatonin, which is produced in darkness and seems to be depressogenic. Here's another one, exercise. It seems to be about as effective as other forms of treatment uh, for depression, and it can, this one can be used as an adjunct to either. Some people have questioned the long-term effects. It uh, seems to fade a bit. Uh, the benefits that um, are observed could be due to a lot of things, being healthier, fitter, improved self-image, uh, diverting negative thoughts while you're uh, tr concentrating on putting a golf ball in the hole or something. You're not thinking about your um, unfortunate uh, life uh, and the, the reasons for your depression. It could be exposure to fresh air and sunshine or simply the social contact that you get down at the gym. But put all of those things together, are lots of reasons to expect that um, exercise would be a useful therapy. Now, unfortunately, there's a bit of a catch-22 in that if people are extremely depressed, it's very difficult to get them out of their bed to do any exercise in the first place. Here's another one, pets, pet or pet therapy. Uh, the companionship of animals can be very important to people, uh, perhaps elderly, widowed, or bullied children. The pets are non-judgmental, and they make unconditional bonds. Uh, the dependency of the pet may be important because it adds purpose to the life. It's a child surrogate. Uh, and uh, dogs, of course, need exercise. So <laughs> here's the motivation to get out and do a bit of exercise yourself. And there are quite a number of studies that show the benefits of contact with animals in reducing stress, uh, which, again, seem to be uh, comparable to other uh, therapies, in this instance, behavioral stress reduction programs. A glass of red wine will do you good, apparently. Um, Moderate consumption, that is two to seven glasses per week, was shown to reduce the likelihood of depression by 32%. However, very heavy drinking, of course, <laughs> uh, is associated with higher levels of depression, not surprisingly. Uh, drinking to forget your troubles, no doubt. The, the people who did this research uh, wondered whether it would have the same protective uh, effect against depression as it does against cardiovascular disease. There is a lot of interest in a chemical called resveratrol, which is contained a non-alcoholic component 
particularly of red wine. Uh, and, uh, but one has to say that this is purely correlational research, and there are other uh, possibilities. There are other things that could be mediating this effect. One is the Mediterranean diet, which has been shown in research also to protect against both cardiovascular illness and uh, depression. General health, uh, wealth and lifestyle, people who, uh, who have a glass of wine or two tend to be uh, sort of well-off people who can afford uh, the wine, for example, and it is all part of their general lifestyle. Plus the fact that um, when you're having uh, a drink, rather than getting drunk, you're usually doing it in a sociable situation, and the social context itself might be important in protecting you against depression. Yeah, a rather interesting and, and surprising one. Um, if you create a facial expression appropriate to a particular emotion, like an angry frown or a nice happy smile, you will to some extent induce that feeling in yourself. It's impossible not to. Uh, maybe something to do with method acting. But uh, because of that effect, uh, Botox has been found to reduce the symptoms of depression <laughs> when it is focused around the area that you would need to use to, make, uh, to transmit negative emotions, like frowning. If you can't frown, you can't feel angry, <laughs> is, is the argument behind it. Now, of course, um, the reverse would also apply that if you freeze the laugh lines underneath the eyes, you're probably going to make it more difficult for a person to be happy. Uh, and uh, oh, I don't know how major this effect is, but it's just theoretically very interesting that you might be able to treat depression by carefully applied Botox, apart from the effect of thinking that you look better, and uh, that might improve your outlook on life as well. Of course, could be argued that that's the way around it goes. Uh, but um, other people have noticed that, uh, or suggested, that if you impair empathy, uh, you could damage social relationships. If you cannot uh, sympathize with somebody and show that you do, uh, they're going to think you're a bit cold. And somebody else suggested, well, maybe if you cannot express surprise, raising your eyebrows, it will make, me, make you more gullible. <laughs> uh, there is um, interesting research uh, along those lines, I have to say. I probably have uh, action taken <laughs> out by uh, the, um, the management of this lady. I don't know who she is, though, of course. <laughs> Just picked up that from the web. Uh, now, here's another treatment. Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That is uh, creating a little electromagnetic field, uh, weak currents above certain brain areas may um, alter feelings and behavior. Um, they usually go for the frontal area of the brain, particularly left frontal, seems to be the focus of activity here. Um, it seems to work to some extent, and it's non-invasive, certainly compared with electroshock therapy or surgery, <laughs> leucotomies and things, um, with relatively few side effects, just the occasional seizure or <laughs> headache. <laughs> Nothing too bad, you know. Uh, as I say, it's got, there is some evidence of its efficacy, but uh, there are so many variables still to be studied, like how strong the magnetic field is, exactly what part of the brain you put it over, for how long, on how many different sessions, and so on, that it, um, it remains primarily uh, a field for research. Uh, plus the fact that it's very difficult to think of a perfect control in that it, it's uh, even if you were sort of waving uh, a wand over the top of somebody's head, they would know that there wasn't a, a magnetic field there because um, there are apparently scalp sensations that enable the, the patient to, to know that they're getting active treatment or not. So it's quite hard 
to devise um, a proper control for double-blind study. Not all of the environmental effects uh, uh, on people's depression are necessarily psychological ones. Some of them can be chemical. Um, ecstasy is very popular in the nightclubs, as you know, and uh, there is concern that it depletes the serotonin system in the brain and makes the, the user more prone to depression, both in the short term where the users talk about Suicide Tuesday, you know, they've had a great weekend, but then Tuesday they're paying for it. Uh, or the effects can be permanent, that if you take enough ecstasy for long enough, you burn out your serotonin system so that uh, it makes it much more difficult to get normal contentment out of your normal life activities. In one study, uh, adolescents who had used ecstasy and, and speed, incidentally, amphetamine, uh, showed twice the um, depressive symptoms over a five-year follow-up. Um, so the, the worst thing, apparently, is to give up ecstasy. If you, uh, that's what's difficult. It's a bit, bit like smoking, I suppose, you know, that um, after you've been smoking for a while, you've got to keep smoking or it's extremely, because it's extremely painful not to. Smokers deceive themselves into saying that they enjoy a cigarette. No, they don't. They're frightened of the uh, negative effects of, uh, of giving it up. Uh, so it is concern, and it might be that the popularity of ecstasy would have something to do with the apparent increase in, in the figures for depression across the population as a whole, with a lot more people having tried ecstasy when young and are now off it but, uh, but paying for it to some degree. Uh, another nightclub drug that's quite popular is called ketamine, uh, sometimes called Special K or Kit Kat is another name used for it. They get uh, highs and trances in, in uh, the dance halls with it. Uh, it's been around for a long time because it's an approved anaesthetic, particularly for horses, I have to say. <laughs> uh, but uh, there is a current renewal of interest in the scientific world uh, in, with respect to its possibilities as a very fast-acting act antidepressant drug. Um, whereas SSRIs like Prozac might take a couple of weeks to work, uh, ketamine is used intravenously and, and uh, may lift depression within hours. So if somebody really is on the edge of suicide, it, it might be worth doing. Uh, its effect seems to be through the glutamate uh, neurotransmitter system, uh, which raises neuron excitability. Uh, so a picture of it in rats, incidentally. And here's uh, these little... Uh, nodules in, in the rat's brain which increase the connectivity between neurons and um, raises the general excitability of the brain. The effects may be uh, operating by the same mechanism as shock therapy did, when well, it's not so fashionable now, but uh, a lot of psychiatrists I know insist that it did work. It's just that they didn't know how and it all seemed a little bit crude uh, and horrible, so that it, they're phasing it out a bit now. But it, it might be that ketamine will, uh, or transcranial magnetic stimulation will produce similar effects, but rather less drastically. Uh, of course, it's not without dangers. Addiction, hallucination, bladder damage, occasional death. That's a side effect to be concerned about, certainly. Uh, but it's already being used in America off-label as a treatment for depression. When I say off-label, that means that a drug is approved for one purpose but is being used for another for which it is not approved. But there are um, clinics in America where you can go in and get yourself a shot of ketamine uh, if you are severely depressed.
Now, I promised uh, in my summary to mention suicide, and uh, here it is. Uh, obviously, uh, suicide is, is one of the worst side effects of depression. Uh, it increases the likelihood of suicide by about 20 times. In other words, a very um, high risk factor associated with severe depression. All psychiatric conditions actually increase suicide risk. Anorexia does, drug use, chronic pain, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, impulse control disorders raise the risk. They all raise the risk of depression, but none as much as depression, raise the risk of suicide, but none more so than depression. Now, how do you tell uh, if a person is on the threshold of suicide? They may precede the act of suicide by making little threats and jokes about topping themselves. They may tie up loose ends. They might write a will or tell you where to, your will can be found. <laughs> Something like that might be a clue. An interesting one is that uh, there have been many reports of a sudden elevation of mood just before the act of suicide. Suddenly the person seems happier and more settled. They've made their decision and uh, they're ready to go with it. So it might be something to watch out for. The background risk factors, of course, include family history of suicide, poor lacking social support, and the availability of means which is a big thing, particularly if you've got guns in the house. So that uh, can increase the likelihood that you're going to shoot yourself. Um, there are sex differences. Women attempt suicide uh, roughly twice as often as men, and they're more often uh, using overdose of drugs, uh, which is perhaps why it doesn't succeed. You can get actually saved if you try to kill yourself with drugs brought around by the medical services. Uh, me, men actually succeed in killing themselves twice as often as women. And the reason is that they use uh, decisive uh, modes like shooting themselves. Um, transsexuals and lesbians have a slightly elevated risk of suicide compared to other sex orientation groups, uh, although that is something that might change with increasing tolerance in society of uh, differing lifestyles. Young people, older people have higher rates. Previous attempts, uh, of course, predict future attempts, particularly when it's a violent mode like trying to hang yourself, drown yourself, uh, jumping off a cliff or building, or shooting yourself. Uh, all of those, if you've done them before, you're likely to do them again, much more so, and, and to use the same mode. On the, on the second attempt. Nightmares following a suicide attempt seem to be a bad sign in terms of the likelihood of, of repeating the attempt, but other sleep disturbances were not connected in this particular study, Scandinavian study. Uh, it's amazing that the people who will commit suicide, you'd think if you were Stephen Fry with such high intelligence, enormous uh, success, in, in uh, enter the entertainment world and so on. You think he had everything to live for, but he's tried to kill himself on a, at least a couple of occasions and uh, apparently suffers from bipolar disorder. Now, it's not much use asking your, your patients if they are thinking of killing themselves because they're unlikely to tell you. They tend to conceal their attention, their intentions. Uh, Two-thirds or more of them will deny uh, having had any intent, intent to kill themselves shortly before they, they do so. Uh, now, there are more subtle laboratory tasks that will help identify people who are um, at risk of suicide. And uh, they use word associations and reaction times, typically, to give clues that are not fakeable. One test is called the Stroop, and the Stroop test works by interference between the meaning of a word and the color in which the word is depicted. And people who are actually more likely to go on and kill themselves find it more difficult to describe the color 
of the word because they are so absorbed uh, attending with the meaning of that word. That's how the Stroop test works. Implicit associations, uh, I don't know whether you can actually read these words, but um, in this instance you have to say whether suicide goes to the left of that continuum or to the right of it. We've got life and death, uh, not me and me, but you can shuffle around these words and the, the research of Nock shows that where people have a strong association between the concepts of self and the concept of death or suicide, they are six times more likely to attempt suicide within six months of testing. And that's a much more powerful prediction than any better known predictors, including uh, depth of depression, history of suicide attempts, or their own or clinician expectations of how much at risk they are. So there's uh, research on how to uh, calculate the likelihood that a person is going to kill themselves. There's also research on biomarkers. There is a protein uh, called SAT1, which uh, this chappy um, has uh, Niculescu claims is associated with the likelihood of suicide, working partly with uh, predictive uh, studies and post-mortem studies. That is, he measures this uh, SAT1 in people who have killed themselves. So far, his works only involve men uh, and uh, needs a lot of replication, but it's an interesting one, particularly because that protein is associated with cellular damage and stress. Very new research, and we don't know where it's going to go yet. A lot of people are sceptical of it, I have to say. Now, women are about twice as likely to be depressed as men. And uh, that's an interesting uh, question. The feminist explanation is that it's because women are put upon by society and that they, are, they learn helplessness in Seligman's terms. But there may be more to it than that. Uh, there are almost certainly some biological factors involved. And I mentioned in some of my earlier lectures something called the finger ratio, which uh, is a measure of testosterone exposure if you've got a stubby forefinger compared to the ring finger. And uh, if men have feminized finger ratios, they are more prone to depression than other men. So there seems to be um, some sex hormone uh, connections here, which would imply a biological basis to this. Now, if indeed we accept that women are biologically prone to depression, we might ask, well, maybe does it have uh, some sort of adaptive value for some people to be uh, depression prone? And it could be, I suggest, the, the price that is paid for greater emotional sensitivity in women. Plenty of research to confirm that fact. They have more empathy and social communication skills, but a tendency towards anxiety, depression, and uh, neuroses of one sort or another might be uh, a byproduct of that. One might also ask about the possible selective uh, value of short cert genes. Now, it seems that uh, the short cert uh, arose roughly 80,000 years ago and has been spreading in the population so that about 40% um, of the population carries short certs. And if it hasn't been eliminated over thousands of years as a mutation, you might suppose that it confers some advantage. And these researchers, Belsky et al., reckon that... Um, People who have short genes are susceptible to adversity, but they function better in supportive and enriching environments. They produce research to demonstrate that. And they reckon that vulnerability is probably the wrong word for it. It is better construed as plasticity. And a final point here, that um, depression seems to be on the increase, but is it really? Or is it just a prescription of antidepressant drugs? 
if they don't work for mild depression, then almost certainly they are being overprescribed. And there are a number of reasons why this might be happening. One is that there are lack of resources for alternatives like cognitive behavior therapy. They're time consuming, they're expensive, and it is so much easier for the doctor to say, take these pills and come back in two weeks if you don't feel better. Uh, referring people to cognitive behavior therapy is not uh, really practical. Uh, computerized delivery of CBT might, might help there, but uh, nevertheless, it is just so much easier for a GP to reach for his Prozac. Second possibility is fashionability among celebrities. You get a lot of uh, people like Ruby Wax and, and Stephen Fry and so on talking about their bipolar disorders and how, what a terrible time they've been having where they might have kept it very quiet before. The result is that your average Joe thinks that uh, maybe I ought to have a bit of that <laughs> bipolar. You know, it would make me seem more creative if I could claim that. And um, so it's become fashionable, a bit like tattoos. You know, if David Beckham's got a tattoo, you've got to have one too. And the final uh, reason is that there may be commercial interests, and I won't say what they are, <laughs> that are working to blur the distinction between everyday unhappiness and profound depression, what used to be called melancholia back in the days of Henry Maudsley. Um, and this is a quote from a friend of mine, Jim Wright, an old school friend who's now a professor of psychiatry in Auckland, in an email to me, <laughs> says uh, there is an enormous amount of money to be made from prescribing marginally effective medications to large numbers of people. The subscript, of course, being that uh, there's bugger all money to be made by prescribing effective uh, medications to small numbers of people. So there may be forces at work to extend the title, depression, into uh, more everyday forms of unhappiness. And a final thought is that there are uh, some sociologists particularly say that there's a danger of masking social deprivation, unemployment and social problems by using medical labels when in fact you should be doing something about it, you know, getting jobs for people and so on. There are certain Welsh valleys. This is Ebba Vale, by courtesy of the Welsh Tourist Board, uh, where unemployment is very high, and apparently one in six adults are prescribed antidepressant medication. Uh, it might uh, be no coincidence that um, having that little script in their hands uh, qualifies them for disability benefit on top of any other benefit that they might already be um, receiving. Uh, so there's a, <laughs> there's a promising development. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will take questions. I may not be able to answer them, but I'll certainly take the question. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.